I've heard a pastor use this illustration before. I don't know who it was. Might have been Francis Chan, but I don't really remember. Um, the illustration stuck with me, though. The idea is that if I told you that I had the special ability to play basketball and we went to a basketball court, you would expect to see that in the way I handle the ball and you'd expect my shots to go in. As Christians, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are sealed by him. And the world should be able to see that in us. When the world looks at our life, the fruit of the Spirit should be evident in us. Join us today as we look in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, a passage that tells us what it should look like for us to live in the Spirit. Take your Bible this morning with me and turn to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 5 is where we will be this morning. We probably have four or five weeks still left in Ephesians. Um, just looking ahead at where we are going. Um, we'll probably finish Ephesians somewhere about the second week of February. Um, in February, I think the third Sunday in February, Dan Hyde will be with us. We had Eddie rushing a few weeks ago, and um, Eddie is retiring, and Dan is going to be our um, associational missionary, and um, Dan is uh, going to be with us in about a month in order that you can meet him if you have not, and uh, he's going to come and preach. I'm excited about him being with us. If you have not been with us, we have been in the book of Ephesians looking at what it means to be in Christ, and that's what we're going to be doing today, continuing in this book and talking about what it means to live in the Spirit. Living in the Spirit is what the message is about this morning. Some of you, um, a couple of weeks ago, when it was that weekend when it was so cold, some of you probably experienced a, a blackout or two. I know that in this area we had some of those. North Georgia Electric, TVA, they, they were not able to keep up with the demand for power on that cold weekend when everybody's heat pump was running and trying to stay, trying to stay warm. And then uh, everybody was trapped inside and using all of the electronic things that we use inside. It was just unable to keep up. And so you might have had a blackout or two because those heating and air units use so much power when they're just running all the time and trying to raise your house several degrees it's just constantly running and, and, and using so much power. And, and when you think about it, that's kind of like a demand for, for energy companies that are producing that power to be able to meet the need that we have where we are increasingly dependent on electricity. Some of you will remember in the laughable news of the year that in August of this past year that Gavin Newsom in, in California announced that by the year 2035, there would be no new gasoline car sales in, in California. Everything would be an electric car. And um, if you, if, I don't know what you know about electric cars, but if you have an electric car and you're going to charge one, you could just, uh, uh, you need the same amount of electricity that your HVAC unit uses. And so for our household, we have, you know, we have, uh, uh, me and Amy have a car, and, you know, jo Joseph's going to be driving, so that, that, uh, that's a third car. Well, all of those, that, we're going to quadruple our HVAC, you know, usage. So we're thinking about our power bill quadrupling. You know, you think about that if you were to have electric cars to charge in. So in August, he says, in, in California, by the year 2035, no new car sales. Then in September, do you remember what happened? Energy shortages. Californians, would you please conserve energy? We don't have enough as it is right now, but we want everybody to have an electric car by 2035 because those demands for electricity so huge. Imagine for just a minute, if you think about how we as a society depend on that, imagine that we had some sort of free, unlimited source of energy. Imagine what would happen if we had, if we had something that would power, everybody could have an electric car, have two or three. Your your household, all of your needs would be met. There would be no rolling blackouts. There would be no energy shortages. We had this unlimited free energy. But we didn't use it. 
We didn't use it. We kept living the way that we are now. Energy shortages, conserve, unplug things that aren't charging, don't use big appliances, all that stuff that they say. We, the need was there, and we had something that would fill it, but we didn't use it. Some of you conspiracy theorists say, about know about Nikola Tesla and say, David, that's the truth. But if you're not a conspiracy theorist, think about what it is for the Christian to live that way all the time. For the Christian to know that the power of the Holy Spirit, an unlimited, free to us, the benefits are there for us to use. And yet if a Christian does not live in the power of the Holy Spirit, it is a spiritual life that is full of constant rolling blackouts and constant uh, shortages and this constant struggle to meet the need. What he has called us to do by living in Christ is to live in the Spirit. That's what he has given us, is the gift of his spirit. And as we look to this book of what it means, this letter that Paul has written to the Ephesians to tell them how it is to live in Christ, one of the most exciting things, one of the most practical things that happens for us is that the spirit helps control us and the spirit's power is working in our life. As we've looked at chapters four, five, and six, as we're looking through this end of this letter, it's all practical things. Remember chapters one through three was theologically saying, this is how you are in Christ. Verse, uh, chapters four, five, and six, now that you are in Christ, this is how you practically live. We're fixing to hit a section of Ephesians where all this week and the next three, so the, the four messages here in this little block, they all are, are dependent on each other. They all work together. The same concepts that we're going to hit in the scripture today, we will refer back to over the next three weeks. As we look to this, because one of the most practical ways that the Holy Spirit works in our life and controls our life, one of the most practical ways that the world can see that we are in Christ is when it comes to our relationships. The four passages that we're going to look at, the principle is given to us today, and then some examples of that are given in the subsequent weeks. So today, we're going to be looking at the relationship that, the, that, that you as a Christian have with the Holy Spirit and have with other believers. Next week, we're going to look at what it means for a husband and a wife. The next week, we're going to look at what that means for parents and children. The next week, we're going to look at that, what it means for work relationships. When you think about how, what the Spirit is doing here, what the Holy Spirit is, is doing in our life, how it's affecting our relationships, that's one of the most practical ways and, and one of the best ways that we can see whether we are in Christ or not. One of the advantages of looking at the book of Ephesians is that if he's telling us what it means to be in Christ, every week that we study this passage is an opportunity for us to ask, am I in Christ? Am I living in the Spirit? If that's what he's calling me to do, am I doing that? It's a great book for us to be introspective when we come into the house of the Lord. So let's look together at our passage for today in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 18. He says, Do not get drunk with wine. For that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Today, as we look to this passage I want us to understand the structure of this passage first. Let's note that before we get into the outline. Let's talk about that together a little bit. If you look at verse, if you think back to what I said a while ago, that this passage deals with our relationship with the Holy Spirit and then with other believers. Note how you find that in the text. In verse 18, it tells us that we are to be as Christians filled with the Holy Spirit. But then you will notice that the result of that, the result of our relationship with him comes in verses 19, 20, and 21. And twice in those verses, you have this phrase, one another. So to the extent that we are living in the Spirit, it will affect how we live with other people. How we, how we interact in the relationships that we have, it will matter. Think for a minute about what it says in verse 18. Because verse 18 gives the command, 
And then verse 19, 20, and 21 gives the evidences that will prove whether we are following the command or not. Let's talk about the command in verse 18. And we have looked at this verse numerous times, but I, it, I want this message to stand alone. And if you have not heard, uh, if, if, not, if you've not heard uh, about verse 18, let me just share a little bit about what it says. First of all, there are two commands here. Don't be drunk, be filled with the Spirit. Now, let's talk for a minute about the don't be drunk. This is not a message about whether you should drink or not, okay? It's not, a me- it's not even the point of the text. Oftentimes, we have used this text to talk about what the Bible says about drinking because it's interesting, right? To be drunk is to be, literally, this word in the Greek is kind of the idea of soaked. So, uh, Homer is another place, uh, the, the Greek poet Homer uses this word at one point to describe animal skins that have been stretched to make them elastic and then dripped or soaked in fat. And so the idea of them being immersed and soaked in that fat is, the, is the, kind of the essence or the idea of this word. So when you think about what it's talking about, it says don't be drunk. Don't be soaked through with alcohol. It's kind of the, it's kind of the picture that's given, right? Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And what we've talked about before is, is that what, this, is, this is a great argument for, the, for, the, for when you th- think about drinking alcohol. But the idea here is, is that when, when, a, when a drunk drinks wine or alcohol, they become filled with it and they become controlled by it, right? It's one of the things that happens when we drink, right? The more that we drink, our inhibitions are lowered and what begins to shine through is old sinful self. It causes us to do the things that we know that we shouldn't do. Many times drinking is going to lead to other kinds of sins because our inhibition is lowered and we are not in control of ourselves. You remember that the fruit of the Spirit, we look back at Galatians, included in the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. When we drink, we lose self-control. That's why we have songs about, you know, dancing on tables and lampshades on heads and that kind of stuff, right? Because we lose control. It's not us or it's us to our most, it's the most us, right? It's the least God and the most us. It's the least spirit and the most us. And so in those moments, the passage, of the, the passage is not about whether you should drink or not, okay? It, it, it should be included in the discussion because of what it implies for us. As Christians, we are to be controlled by the Spirit. The same way that the drunk is filled with alcohol and controlled by alcohol, the Christian should be filled with the Spirit and controlled by the Spirit, The same way that a drunk gets pulled over on the road and they are charged with with driving under the influence. As a Christian, at any moment, you should be pulled over and you should be given a ticket for living under the influence of the Spirit. That's what our life should be. We are under the influence. It's about the idea of who is controlling us. Be immersed, be filled with the Spirit is the idea. This is the structure And so what he's telling us here is that he's saying to get us to the point of of the evidence is to be filled with the Spirit, to live in the Spirit is going to be the Spirit to be in control of you. Now listen, when it tells us to be filled with the Spirit, I want to first let me address a misconception. Let me let me let me define a little more clearly about what that means. Sometimes when you hear people talk about being filled with the Spirit, they describe extremely dramatic acts. Oh, He got filled with the Spirit, he spoke in tongues. He got filled with the Spirit, and he ran the aisles. He got filled with the Spirit, and he he dove through a ring of fire, or whatever happens, right? Very charismatic kind of things. That sometimes people talk about being filled with the Spirit as if it is Christian plus. Being filled with the Spirit is not Christian plus. Being filled with the Spirit is Christian normal. It's how we are to be all the time in the Spirit. Listen, as a Christian, you are always indwelled with the Spirit, right? The 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 uh, the bulletin today, which I don't surely I've got one somewhere. Uh, The bulletin today, the verse that we chose for the front says, "You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to Him." If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit of God, and you never lose 
the Spirit of God. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit is always indwelling your life, is always living within you. You are constantly and forever sealed by the Spirit because you are a Christian and a believer in Christ. You never lose that. But the Bible also tells me that I am not to grieve the Spirit. I'm not to contend with the Spirit. I'm, I have this war going on with me all the time that is spirit or flesh. And when I let the flesh emerge, push the spirit down. And what shows? But if I will let the spirit have control in my life, if I will be filled with the spirit, I'm not pushing the spirit down. He's filling me. And then what do people see? Not me. They see him. This is Christian normal. This is the ideal. This is what it is to be in Christ. Being filled with the Spirit is not a dramatic thing that happens that makes you want to take up snakes, okay? Being filled with the Spirit is a thing that happens where it is evident in your life that you are living in a godly way. You are a reflection of Christ. Being filled with the Spirit is what it means when we talk about, as Ephesians says, being in Christ. L living with this control over our sinful nature is what the Holy Spirit does for us. It enables Him to live through us so that we, uh, our, our sinful nature is overcome. Let's look for a minute, at, jump into the outline, which we're going to focus on 19, 20, and 21 because the question we could ask today is, okay, if this is Christian normal, if I'm supposed to be filled with the Spirit, if this is the command, how do I know that I'm filled with the Spirit? How can I know that? Those three verses give us three ways that we can tell whether we are in the Spirit or not. So today, I'm going to share with you those three reasons. And as I do that, remember, this is a time of introspection. What we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be saying, okay, this is, what the Holy, this is what the Bible says I should be if the Holy Spirit is filling me. Am I that? I believe a couple things are going to happen. You could be here and you could be a believer and you could listen to everything I'm saying and you could say, yeah, I feel like, the, yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit is evident in my life. You could be here, you could be a believer, you could, you could listen to the, the things I'm fixing to put on the screen, the things we're fixing to look at from Scripture, and, and, and the Holy Spirit could say to you, I'm here, but you're pushing me down a whole lot. That's not what they see. It's not evident. You're indwelt with the Spirit, but you're not filled with the Spirit. We could go through this message, and by the end of it, you could say to yourself, I'm not indwelt by the Spirit. None of those things are evident in my life, ever. And you would surrender your heart and life to him today. When you think about what is controlling your life, if it is not the Holy Spirit, the one who doesn't have the Holy Spirit doesn't know him. That's the verse we just read that's on the front of the bulletin from Romans 8. Let's look to these evidences. What are the evidences of living in the Spirit? What happens when you live in the Spirit? The first thing that happens is you have you. If you are living in the Spirit, you will have a singing heart. You will have a singing heart. Look at verse 19. It tells us that being filled with the Spirit, we will address one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We will make melody to the Lord in our hearts. There's something here about a spirit of joyful worship that happens in the life of a believer. Let's note a few things about this text. Singing is an important part of our worship, right? Singing is an important part of our worship in a couple of ways. If You may say, David, I'm not a singer. I'm not a singer, but, but even if you're not a singer, it's important for a couple of reasons. One, the glory of our Lord is so good it doesn't need to just be thought about or even talked about. It needs to be felt and experienced. And even if you're not a singer, you may be a person who say, David, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I bet there's been a time when a song has got a hold of you and you have felt that song. It may have been in a church service. It may have been in the shower. It may have been driving down the road in your car. But there has been a time where a song has gotten a hold of you and there is an Singing is this physical act that elicits in us this emotional response. And because we are filled with the Spirit, 
The Spirit, as I said before, is not all about just feeling and dramatic and excitement, but what happens when we're filled with the Spirit and when we are singing is it is, is, it, is a physical thing that is allowing us to feel something emotionally and react to Him emotionally. Something else that's interesting about singing is that singing is, can be like a walking theology book. Singing is, you know, if, if we want children to memorize a thing, we put it to song. ABCs, that sort of thing, right? We put it to song. As a believer, if we are, as a church, singing songs that are sound in a theological way, what you have is you have a theology book that you have memorized that you take with you. When you find yourself vacuuming and humming and you're singing those songs, you find yourself singing a hymn that's wor- that, that you've sang it so often that the words are almost automatic and you have forgotten what they mean until you listen to what you're singing and you realize, oh, this is a truth that I needed to hear. God's using that to show me, right? The Holy Spirit causes us to be joyful and thankful and worshipful. And as Brian mentioned this morning in Sunday school, we sing, there's within my heart a melody. Jesus was sweet and low. As a believer, there's within our heart a melody that should come forth to the world. It should be this, our whole life should be a song of praise to him. Notice that singing, it can happen all by yourself and a song can get a hold of you all by yourself. But isn't it something good about singing together? Yesterday I had those men sing with me to God be the glory and those booming voices to sing, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And there, it's, there's something different going on in that room. You encourage one another with that. When we come in here together and we sing, we're encouraging one another in doing it. When you hear a song on the radio, when someone stands and sings a special in church, and it's the Lord speaking to you and saying, this is what you needed to hear today. There's something about singing. In fact, notice the passage tells us in verse 19 that singing can be an encouragement and it is not simply meant to happen in an isolated box. We are to sing to each other, the verse says. We are to address each other with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and we are to sing to the Lord. We make a melody to the Lord in our hearts. Now, that phrase right there should really stick with you, especially if you're a person who says, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. Well, good. The passage doesn't say make a melody to the Lord with your voice. It says make a melody to the Lord with your heart. The question is not can you sing or not. The question is, is your heart worshipful? That's the question. You see, everybody in the room may not be musically inclined or, or, or music may not be your thing. And I, I want you to understand that I, that's not a thing that I'm trying to push on you. There is an importance of singing in our worship. And there is something unique about singing and music. But that may not be the primary way that you worship or feel worship. If you were at the tent revival, some of you were, had, there was kind of an off-putting experience where um, there was a fellow who, who felt like everybody around him should hold their hands in the air when they were singing. And if they were not holding their hands in the air, then they were not experiencing worship. In fact, he came up, he came up and shared with us one night that, that uh, we all needed to fight the devil if we didn't hold our hands up, we wasn't fighting the devil. And there was kind of this weird feeling of the people around him. If, if your hands are not in the air, you're not worshiping. You may say, David, I'm not a big singer. That's not how I worship him. Okay. Okay. I'm not saying to you, get him up, buster. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying here. What I am saying is, is that if you are filled with the Spirit, there will be something worshipful in your heart and it will make a melody to those that are around you and it will make a melody to our God. It's really interesting to me. I don't know what it means when you read through commentaries like studying this week. What does it mean when it says address each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? What's, what's the difference? That seems to be a list of different types of songs. What's the meaning behind that? And different commentaries will give you all kinds of thoughts as to what they think those things are. But what I love about singing and what I love about worship is it's varied. It can come in various ways. 
if, if you were to ask me, if I was writing the commentary on this, what does it mean to, for psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? I don't know that it matters specifically what each one of those things are, but I think it shows us that there are varied ways in which we address each other and there are varied ways in which we worship. Sometimes I need a fast, peppy, worshipful song. Sometimes I need something slow that, that elicits in me this feeling of gratitude to him that it does different to us. And so knowing whether a person needs a psalm or a spiritual song is part of the discernment that we live. That's being filled with the Spirit and recognizing that today this person needs an uplifting word. Today this person needs a reflective thought. This person needs me to be and we share. It's what we need from the Holy Spirit. Think for just a minute about what it is to have a worshipful heart. Are you worshiping him? Is there this worshipful attitude in your heart, not just at church? That's one thing. In fact, I would say that if you're coming into church and your heart is not worshipful, the, the problem's beyond church. Most likely, Sunday, Monday through Saturday, there's not a worshipful heart. A worshipful heart is in the living of it. It's living in the Spirit. It's all of our experiences. One of the evidences of being filled with the Spirit, of living in the Spirit, will be a singing heart. Look at verse 20. The second evidence is found there. Do you have a singing heart? Do you have a satisfied heart? Do you have a satisfied heart? The the thing that will happen when the Holy Spirit fills us is the person living in the Spirit will have a grateful heart that offers thanksgiving to the Lord. Christians should be the most grateful people. As we've looked at this book of Ephesians and as we've talked about over and over again, the idea of thanksgiving should come because as Christians, we have been saved from the pit like he has reached down into the pit of our sin where we were and he has pulled us up. That alone, if we had nothing else to thank him for, that alone is something to thank him for. Every person in the room could be thankful for the gifts of life and the blessings of life that he has given that have come from him. The Christian recognizes that all that we have comes from him, spiritually, physically, Every single thing that we have comes from him. And so the Christian above all people should have a contented, satisfied heart knowing that their God, who owns the cattle of a thousand hills, can meet that little need that we have. We should be so grateful and so thankful for what he has provided, knowing that no matter what we don't have, we have a whole lot that we don't deserve. And so when we start thinking about it in terms like that and recognizing it like that, Christians, those filled with the Spirit, should recognize it. We should recognize our position. We should recognize that He is God. Notice how the passage goes in verse 20. We should give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't the last half of that verse very lofty for a simple command to just be thankful? Do you know why I think the language is there? Be thankful to Almighty God who has given you life and provides everything that you need. That's what's kind of being the idea there. It's this simple command, be thankful, and then he tacks on all of that lofty so we recognize our spot. We recognize that we do not produce. We recognize that we are stewards. Everything we have comes from him. We've been blessed by it. And so the way that we handle it, the way that we use it is very important. This verse zeroes in on the fact that it is to God that we give thanks. But notice something else about the verse in verse 20. We're to give thanks to God in the name of our Lord Jesus, but notice how and when we are to do it, which makes the verse much more difficult. Always and for everything. Give thanks always and for everything. But David, what I'm going through right now really, really stinks. And David, if you knew what I'm going through right now, you would not expect me to be thankful to God. I'm not trying to diminish the thing that you're going through. 
But one of the things that we hold to as believers is that the God that we serve is sovereign and in control of it all. If we don't believe that, why would we worship him? Why would we worship and serve a God who can be controlled by others and who is handcuffed by the circumstances that we experience? So as a Christian, one of the things that we recognize is that everything that we have comes from him and everything we endure, he allows. Everything we endure, he may not, um, he may not have brought that into your life. He may, not have be, he may not be the genesis of that thing, but he is allowing that thing to do something in you. He ultimately takes responsibility for all of it. In that fact, what the Christian is doing by recognizing that it all comes from Lord God, Lord Jesus, by recognizing that, we're saying, God, you have, remember, who has control of us? Not alcohol and not the awful circumstances of our life. Who has control of us? The Spirit is filling me. The Spirit's in control of me. If I'm living in the Spirit, then what I recognize is that if the Spirit is able to take the jealousies that I feel, if He's able to help me absorb the slights that I feel, when I get angry and mad and tempted, if the Holy Spirit is able to deal with all of that junk that's going on inside of me, I am a microcosm of my environment. And if he's dealing with all of that stuff that's rolling around inside of me, he's also handling all this stuff out here. He's handling this whole universe. And to recognize him as sovereign allows us to be able to give thanks to him always and for everything. In the name of the Lord our God, Jesus Christ. Think about that for just a minute. What's happening in us if he is controlling us, he is controlling how we move through this world. He's controlling our reaction to all of those bad circumstances. This is what the Holy Spirit will do in the life of a believer. We're, listen, we're all tempted to have those moments where we get into mully grubs and we complain about things. We've all got those moments, okay? And sometimes we just won't pout. But what do people know about you? Are you most known for having a grateful, worshipful, contented heart? Or are you most known for your complaints and negativity? That's a real question. That's a real question for believers. Because the, the, when it says give thanks, we're not talking about just gathering around a table with a horn of plenty and a turkey. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is giving thanks always and in everything, are we approaching every instance of our life as in he's got this? As in I am going to, I'm, I'm not going to whine about this thing, I am going to get through this because he will not leave me and he will not forsake me. And he is filling me and he's handling all of this stuff inside of me that makes a man corrupt. He's dealing with that. And if he can deal with that, he can deal with this. I'm going to trust him. I'm going, to have a, I'm going to have a satisfied, contented outlook about this thing because he's the one who's in control. The Christian is the one who lives a life of grateful thanksgiving. What are the evidences of living in the Spirit? Well, one is going to be that we're going to have a singing, worshipful heart. The second is we're going to have a satisfied, thankful, contented heart. But when you get to verse 21... It tells us that those that are living in the Spirit will have a submissive heart. Will have a submissive heart. Those who are living in the Spirit will submit themselves for the good of other people. I want to talk for a bit about this verse and especially that word submit because this thought, this concept is what drives the following messages, the following passages of Scripture that come. Submit, in the Greek, is this word, hupotasso. And the word itself is about, um, the word itself is about an army, a group of soldiers coming into formation. 
When I was in uh, ROTC in high school, uh, there, there was a certain way there that we would line up. So when we would when we would line up as a, a, when we would line up as a as a company, you would have those squads, and the the front row would be squad you know squad A and B and C. You'd have these squads that would be in order, and the first person, the person who would be who would be all the way to, to the right of that side, if you're facing it to the left, would be the squad leader, and and then it would it would fall in natural progression down the way. And you, and you knew where you were supposed to go in that, in that formation. And so when the call came, fall in, you went to, you went to that spot. And, and you, were to, you were to measure and make sure that you were in the right spot and the right distance away from each other. We're going to be inspected here. And you, and you stand in formation. It's kind of this falling in to where we belong kind of idea. That being the case... Submission is not really about rank or about authority. It is, but it's not in an equality sort of way. It's in a functional sort of way. The idea there is, is that, that all of us, if you consider the verse, what the verse is saying is, who submits? Look at verse 21, who submits? Everybody submits. Everybody and who do we submit to? Each other. We submit to each other. This is a huge, it's a huge thought for us. If we, because the world will look at the word submit and say, say the Bible hates women. Submit, right? So the Bible hates women. Those people who pronounce that, in my estimation, have never studied their Bible. Because it's really hard to read the last part of Ephesians 5 and the rest of Ephesians 6 and tell me that the Bible hates women. Submitting, notice how the Bible over and over again is telling us, submit to each other. Verse 21 says it right here. Think for a minute about the concept that you find in every aspect of Christian life. One in particular that I'll give you deals with the idea of spiritual leadership. So multiple times in the letters of the New Testament, the, the, the word is given from the, the writer of the letter to the church, submit to those that are in leadership positions. Submit to those. Obey them. One particular place is, is in the book of, uh, I think Hebrews 13 is the one that I gave. It doesn't quite use the word submit, but the idea is here. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Over and over again, the Bible will tell those in the early church, there are those that are uh, apostles. Give yourself over to the apostles' teaching. Um, submit to Christian leaders. They're looking out for you. They have to give an account for you. That they, they're, they're going to be judged based on how they lead you. So notice that and follow their leadership. Submit to Christian leaders. You know who Christian leaders are submit to? Those that they're leading. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 and 19 said, For though I am free of all, I have made myself a servant of all, that I might win more of them. It's this mutual thing that is happening. In the next few messages that we're going to look at, there's going to be a very clear declaration of submission. And in the next three messages that we look at, think for a minute about what's said. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. That's there. And you know who husbands are supposed to submit to? Their wives, you know why? Because they love their wives with a self-sacrificial love that is a Christ-like love. It's very clearly in the passage. Children, submit and obey your parents. Parents, submit to your children by not provoking them to wrath. Employees, submit to your bosses by honoring what they would have you to do, by respecting them and doing the things that they ask you to do and doing a good job of it. Bosses, submit to your employees by not taking advantage of them and treating them the right way. Throughout Scripture, this mutual submission 
is what will happen when we are filled with the Spirit. We will recognize each, it will not just be about what we want. Our personal preferences begin to go out the window. And what we begin to look to is to the good of others. We begin to consider others more important than ourselves. And we begin to look to them and we begin to serve them as they need us to. A spirit-filled person will, will get rid of selfish agendas and they will simply serve Christ. Now I want you to think for just a minute about something I said before. Do you remember how I said that being filled with the Spirit is not some dramatic display of, uh, uh, of charisma? It's not some d- d- dramatic display like that. It's Christian normal. What do you think is more advantageous for the church? A person who speaks in a language nobody understands? A person who hoops and hollers during worship? or a church that gets along with each other. If the mission we have is to reach this lost world, what advantage is the excitement and what advantage is it for a church to be at peace with each other? You see, if we're fussing and fighting among ourselves, we can't make disciples. And making disciples is the mission. That, that's the mission. That's, that's it. That's what we're here for, is to make disciples. That happens two ways, remember? <laughs> we see them baptized. We see them saved and baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. We grow in grace. We grow in knowledge. We grow together with him. What are we doing in Center Grove? And we can't do that when we're unwilling to submit to each other and live together as he's called us to. If we have a group of people whose sinful natures have risen to the top, we've shoved the Spirit down in there. We're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, but we stuffed him down in there the same what I'm doing here is like you know when the garbage is full you know how you stuff the garbage down in there you know so you can fit a little bit more in we stuff that Holy Spirit down in there and you have a imagine what a church full of people who have stuffed the Holy Spirit so far down that all that you can see is sinful self you think that church is making disciples I can absolutely with 1000% certainty tell you they are not making disciples they are not They're worried about everything else under the sun. They're worried about whether they get their uh, color on the wall. They're worried about uh, about whether the church is doing this ministry that they want. They're worried about about if the if the money's going to this thing or to that thing. They're worried about uh, they're worried about their feelings. They're worried about what kind of songs we sing. That's what they're worried about because it's a preference. When we do the Spirit like this and we just shove him on down, what we want floats to the top. But if we'll be filled with the Spirit, if he's being praised, I mean, I know some churches, we don't, we don't fight over this whole lot. So this is one I'll, pick, this one I'll use. We don't fight over whether we're singing old hymns or new songs. We don't fight over that a whole lot. We don't. There's some places that are really, really divided over that. But you know what? If you're filled with the Spirit, it don't matter if the song was written in 1887 or if it was written in 2007. It will not matter to you because what your focus is going to be is does it praise Jesus? You won't care because your focus is going to be on Him. That for us as a church, that should rise to the top. David, how is it that a church filled filled full of sinners who have this sinful nature. How are they ever going to do any kind of mission like make disciples? How are they ever going to coexist together? We would be tempted to say, well, just get all that sin out of your life. Just get all that sin out of there. All that stuff that's causing you these problems, just toss it out. Just throw it out. Read about this. This is a good way to think about it. If I, if I were to take this glass and I were to say, okay, we, we, we want to get all the air 
out of this glass? How do we, how do we get it out of there? Well, we could come up with all kind of contract, contraptions to do that, you know. Maybe very simply, we, you know, oh, it didn't make a good seal. Well, I'll make me, a, I'll design me something that'll slip over this and it'll airtight seal it and it'll vacuum and it'll suck all the air out of it. Well, that seems difficult. I don't, I don't have any of that stuff. We could put this glass on a rocket ship. We could launch it into space. Once this glass enters the vacuum of space, if the pressure doesn't squish it, all the air will be gone out of this glass. And we could come up with all kinds of ways that are complicated and difficult to extract the air from this glass. Or we could very simply just fill it up. And see, so many times we talk about what it means to, to start the new year off right, and as Jason told us, to grow toward maturity. And you know what we're thinking about? There's all this junk in my life, and i got to figure out how to get it out of there. Let's get it out of there. That's not what the passage is telling us to do. You know how the passage tells us to overcome our sinful spirit? Be filled with something else. Don't try to get all that out of there. Be filled with the Spirit. And if you're filled with the Spirit, there's not room for jealousy. There's not room for anger or dissension or lust or greed. There's not room for any of that because you're filled with the Spirit. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I would like for you to envision the glass of water that I just held up before you. And ask yourself, does my life look like that? Listen to me, I'm not asking you what little things are standing in the way between you and God. That's part of it. But let's just be frank. There's so much junk in there that if we were to try to renovate and move it all out to the dumpster, we might be there a long time. The question is not what all kind of junk is in my life. The question might be how filled with the Spirit are you? Because if you're filled with the Spirit, all that junk just goes away. This morning, question number one, do you have the Holy Spirit living within you? Are you a believer who possesses the Holy Spirit of God. Have you ever felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever read his word and a light bulb came on? Have you ever felt the, the voice of God speak to you? I'm not talking about hearing audible voices. I'm talking about have you sensed the Spirit of God leading you to a thing? Have you had the discernment of the Spirit to know a thing that you shouldn't know, but it's only through God's grace that that thing has been revealed to you? Does the Holy Spirit live in your life? If not, then this morning you are not a believer in Jesus Christ. You do not have Jesus. If you cannot look to the Holy Spirit's work in your life, you don't have Jesus. That Romans 8 passage is on the front of the bulletin very clearly tells us if we do not have the Spirit, we do not have Jesus. If we have Jesus, we will have the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, if you're here this morning and you're not sure as to whether your relationship with our Lord is right or not, then to, this morning you need to come immediately to this altar. Take me by the hand and say, David, I need to talk some, to somebody I need to know for sure today that I have the Spirit and therefore have Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer. Does your life look like that glass? What's exposed to the world? Self or spirit? Flesh or spirit? How's that affected your personal testimony? How's that affected your family? How's that affected our church?
when we look at just the specifics that Paul gave, it's not an exhaustive list, but is your heart worshipful and joyful? Is your heart thankful and contented? Is your heart submissive to others and sensitive to their needs? If he's spoken to you about one of those areas, he said, look, I, I'm living in, in your heart, but you have pressed me down in this particular spot. Come to me and make these things right. Today, I'm gonna to encourage you to, when we sing, just to come and just pray, just take, bring that to him. My desire is that when we would leave this place, every single one of us would look like that glass of water. No room for anything else. Lord, you command us to be filled with your spirit. You command us to do that. Lord, we could come to this altar today and we could pray, Lord, fill me with your spirit. But the onus of the command is on us. So Lord, I pray that we would come in repentance. We would come with hearts that are pliable. We would come setting aside all our willful disobedience and we would bring it to you. Not grieving the Spirit, not quenching the Spirit, but being filled with the Spirit. This morning, Lord, we want to see you in a unique way. Help us to be obedient now. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.